you know, I, I feel like we're all Brooklyn natives at, at, in some capacity. I was born in Brooklyn in East New York and then, you know, moved over to the Boogie Down, but I will always rep Brooklyn. Um, so, uh, Khalil, what, what part of Brooklyn are you from? <laughs> I, I, I'm from like, East Flatbush. East Flatbush. Okay. Yeah. And Natasha, how about you? So I'm born and raised in Manhattan, but I've lived in Brooklyn since after college. I had a small stint in California in between, but I'm in the like Windsor Terrace area. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, we all know the horror stories about New York trains, and I feel like Brooklyn always has trains that are such a hot mess. So <laughs> I'm actually... Uh, happy that we get to do this remotely because I probably would have been late riding the New York, <laughs> the New York public subway uh, to come from Brooklyn, uh, to come from the Bronx to, to Brooklyn. So um, I don't know where our, you know, viewers are tuning in from, but feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm always curious to see where y'all are streaming in from. And now we're going to get into a wonderful discussion. I feel like I've already talked to Natasha and Khalil a little bit about um, their pieces for this collection. But one of the things that I want you to focus on is um, sort of why do you think it's important for Latinx stories to be told? Um, I know that like, obviously this collection is so diverse and so unheard of. And lots of people have said like, this is something that like, you know, I wish I had growing up. Uh, but I feel like, you know, there are so many other writers out there who have stories to tell as well. And sometimes we think that our stories aren't important enough to be told. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about why your story in particular is important to be told and um, the importance of sharing that with community. So can we start with you, Kilo? Oh, sure. I think... Um... I don't know if I always felt that uh, our stories were as unique as they are. Um, you know, I've said you know, previously that uh, you know my brothers who really put me on, you know, when I was really delving more into writing, that he really felt that uh, my perspective uh, uh, as, a, as a black Panamanian is unique, and that it should be part of my selling point when I was pitching to these media companies, you know, to freelance for them or whatever the case was. And he planted that seed um, and a certain series of events, you know, that followed. I met people uh, who were like me, who imparted on me sort of the same passions and desires. And I began to realize that, uh, you know, you're trying to, you know, make yourself visible uh, to people who are like you and, and you're trying to change perception, uh, which is sort of what, you know, my, my, my essay is about in a way is just, you know, talking about not judging books by its covers and, and, and knowing that there's all sorts of people out there um, and, and you have to uh, you know, make room and space for all them to you know, express themselves and their, their unique experiences. Um, so nowadays, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think it's extremely important, especially in the, the era that we're in, uh, tight visibility. And I think we also have the most ears ever that are willing to listen to a variety of stories and, and be embraced uh, or, or that, that will embrace them. You know what I mean? So um, I think it's a perfect time for a project like this um, and, and similar projects to follow. Yeah, awesome. What about you, Natasha? Um, you know, so for me, I, uh, so I'm multiracial. I'm, my, my mother's half Brazilian, half Liberian, and my father's Jewish. And so for me, I think a lot of my life has been trying to put all those pieces together and sort of define what that mixture means. And in doing that, it was really easy for um, me to sort of distance myself from the individual heritages that I have. And specifically my Brazilian heritage, I found um, was often erased because I'm not from Brazil. There isn't one way to look Brazilian um, and I don't speak Portuguese. And so it would often just get left out. It's much easier to be like, oh, I'm black and white and I look white, you know, and so um, it was, in, it was a, a journey, it's taken me a long time for a lot of my different identity to be comfortable owning all of them, but specifically in my Brazilian heritage, um, recognizing that I do have 
a right to it and that it's a part of me. And it's a big part of the community that I grew up in. My grandmother was Brazilian. Um, my cousins are all for different amounts of Brazilian. Some of them are three quarters Brazilian. Some of them are half Brazilian um, or a quarter Brazilian like I am. And, um, you know, we grew up with a lot of Brazilian culture um, and it always felt like when I was outside of that bubble, it was erased from me. And, um, and so I wanted to reintegrate it and, and rewrite it in bold. And so um, I think it, a book like this is an opportunity for everyone, all the contributors who come from so many different backgrounds and places and families to write, write their culture in bold. And, and what's amazing is this is just, we're all just giving one take of that culture, right? Like Khalil's Black Pan Panamanian ba uh, history and story is different than other Black Panamanian stories. My um, mixed Brazilian heritage is different than other mixed Brazilians or just other Brazilians. And so um, I think it's a tiny, it's such a big project, but it's also just such a tiny peak. And I think that's what's so amazing about the book is that it opens so many doors and it's also a fraction of the doors that need to be open. Yeah, I would agree with you. I feel like, you know, I didn't, I didn't think my story was important, right? Like I was just like, oh, who cares about another Honduran, you know, like nobody cares about that. But I think it is important to share our stories because everyone needs to feel seen, feel validated in, in some shape, you know, and, and I feel like we can't rely on the media to do that for us, especially like if you're multiracial, they never really put, you know, the, the different races or different cultures together that are actual like people, right? They always do you, normally like the biracial black and white all the time. You see that in the media and there are so many other, um, you know, multiracial people out there. Like I have a friend that is Jamaican and Dominican and like to see that mix and et cetera, et cetera, it's just, it's just really interesting. And so I think with this collection, it was just so fantastic for um, people to showcase like what it was like for them growing up and how, you know, just because you think you know what a Puerto Rican household looks like, you know, that that wasn't the case for this contributor, or you know what a Brazilian household is supposed to look like that wasn't the case, you know, for you and, and, and et cetera. Um, and I think stories like this kind of inform my relationship when it comes to Latinidad, like that, you know, there's that hashtag like Latinidad is canceled. I forgot who started it but it was started by um, someone who was underrepresented within the, you know, the Latinx community. And I think about a lot about how we, you know, certain parts of my identity are erased or are sort of discounted. And I'm wondering if, you know, if you both struggle with those things as well, where you're like, today, do I feel like being a Black Honduran? Do I, do I feel like not exploiting all of my identities, but it's like having, having to always like showcase that and explain to people like, this is who I am. This is why I do certain things, et cetera, et cetera. Like sometimes I feel like it's just a challenge to exist within Latinidad and, and um, always having to struggle with making people believe that I'm from a certain um, or have a connection to a certain thing. So I'm wondering what your relationship is like with Latinidad and, you know, obviously it says 15 voices from the Latinx diaspora, but do you even identify as a Latinx person? Like how, how have you decided um, to tell your truth basically? And we'll start with you, Natasha. Big question. Um, yeah, so obviously my, um, identity is complicated in some ways and in other ways it's not right because in some ways I'm perceived as a, a white person by most people and so that is an overarching thing is that I can't erase the way that impacts the way I move through the world on a large you know in the majority of situations I'm in however I was raised to be really proud of my background and uh, my family and so um, I just sort of put it all out there. Um, you know, it's not like I like walk into a room and I'm like, 
clink of glass just so everybody knows my mom's black and brazilian um but um but i don't i don't hide it and i don't want to hide it and so i try to find a mixture of um of owning that while also acknowledging the privileges and just the fact that i'm perceived as white and um i think that it you know, it took a long time for me to get to a place where the being having to prove it or having to um, explain it, it stopped being a burden at a certain point. I just started being like, you know what, like the way people see me and what they think about me is not my business. And so I'm going to be who I am, you know, and so the thing for me with my Brazilian heritage specifically, because there isn't a, oh, there's one way to look Brazilian. It's one of the most diverse countries in the world. Um, is when I tell people my background, I get a lot of like, no, right? Like I'll say like, oh, my mom's black. No. Yeah. And she's, and my dad's Jewish. Really? Wow. And yeah. And my mom's actually also Brazilian. What? That, you know what I mean? It's just like more and more everyone thinks I'm like making up bigger and bigger lies. And what ends up happening when I bring up Brazilian is it, there's this like exotification that occurs pretty quickly. Like people make a comment about appearances or, you know, whatever. And it's frustrating that that aspect of my heritage is reduced to that. Not that I wouldn't, I'm not proud of, of beauty, but like, that's not what this is. It's a culture and is my family. And so um, that's something that irritates me a lot. And so that was specifically why I wrote that piece, because it's something that I found um, that, that has ha happened my whole life and really bothers me and I've just sort of gotten to a place where I'm just sort of like if that's who you're going to be I, that's your problem you know what I mean and I can't let it yeah I can't let it get to me because I spent so much of my life being so frustrated about the constant having to prove or explain or correct people and it's like that's a you problem you know so that's sort of where I am now with it and like writing this poem was like a part of releasing that being like you know what if you're gonna say some dumb shit you're gonna get some you're gonna get slashed so yes and the title the title of your piece is caution song like it's it just it just fits it's chef's chef's kiss I feel like uh we should have it printed out <laughs> in in workplaces and schools like it's just it's it's such a wonderful piece on like don't fetishize you know don't 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 do the thing that is so stereotypical of you to do when it comes to this particular um, culture, this identity, like don't do it. Um, what about you, Kolo? Oh, I love that poem as well. Just let me say that. But, <laughs> and what I'm gonna do, just a disclaimer, and I think you would actually enjoy this point, Cerise. I have family that's upstairs. I'm out of town, I'm in Atlanta. They're here for a birthday party for Abuelo, who I wrote about my book. His sister is turning 90 tomorrow. Oh, wow. So he's actually here. Like, I even know I was going to see him this weekend. He's actually upstairs somewhere hanging out. Um, I'm going to give him the book today. When I came in, I came straight down to set up. Um, so if you hear noise, that's what you're hearing. These people ain't seen each other in years. And that's what's going on. Upstairs. So disclaimer. Um, but in terms of, like, you know, struggling with uh, identity, I've always viewed myself as from the Latin uh, world. You know, I, that was my knowledge of myself as a kid, although the people around me didn't get it. You know, the, the kids that I write about my chapter and whatnot, they 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 weren't privy to that being a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. In everyday life currently, what where I find I struggle with it is really like if you do job applications, I think, I think a lot of systems are coming around to the idea of ethnicity versus race and separating like that on applications or whatnot. But if there's any times where I'm forced to choose one, that is usually the time <laughs> because I, I, I review myself as an Afro-Latino. Um, I know I present black, black and never, you know, curly hair as I write about things like that. So, you know, I and I'm proud of it extremely i mean that's the roots of where my family is from uh you know my grandparents are also panamanian on both sides but all their parents were not necessarily you know my mother's sorry my, my maternal grandmother's father was cuban you know so there's you know we i know where the roots actually are but i 
don't struggle with it much unless these days it's like the application or something. I'm very much comfortable in being Afro-Latino, but it's also, I think the world has caught up a little bit and that has given me more reason to not have to choose so much. It's not so much of a, it's not aberration to people. Like we're really out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you you raise actually a really good point, which is like on all of these forms, even the census, um, there, you know, there are so many things that are just lacking or missing. And it does suck when you have to sort of divide yourself and decide like, okay, what what box am I going to check, you know, for, for this application? And honestly, sometimes I'm just like, you know what? It's just easier to check black or it's just easier to, to check, you know, Hispanic, Latinx. Like normally I'm just like, let's see, whichever one is like closer to the top and I see it first, I'm like, that's it. If it doesn't give me the option to select more than one. Sometimes they have an option that says Hispanic non-black. That's a that's like a big option. I'm like, dog, what do you mean? <laughs> I've seen that, that and like, it's it's very frustrating because it's like, wait, what do you mean? Like, how can I not be, you know, even though I don't use the identifier Hispanic, but like, you know, there right. are several people it's like my mom's generation. They they actually mm -hmm. use the term Hispanic, um, mm -hmm. and so for for them to see that, it's like, wait, what? Like, you know, and it fascinates me because I'm like, who are the people that are creating these forms? Exactly. And, you know, like, I'm like, you may, you must not have a diverse panel of people looking over these forms if you're asking these silly questions. Um, and, you know, and then that that also impacts other things like applying for scholarships <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we can go down a rabbit hole with that. So I don't I don't <laughs> I don't want to continue to focus on that. But you both have, um, you know, various experience with writing. So obviously, Khalil, you had a blog, um, you've written for different media um, publications um, that Serena read in your lovely bio, like Madame Noir um, and, and Blavity. And Natasha, you, you know, you've written um, fiction for young adults, but you, you also do screen, um, writing screenplays and stuff like that. Uh, so what was it like for you turning the lens to write poetry and uh, Khalil for you turning the lens to write, um, you know, personal nonfiction? I feel like your other stuff is nonfiction as well, right? Because you're writing about dating and, and um, uh, you know, culture, but when you're turning the lens on yourself, it can be a little different. I know for me, I've written lots of fiction and I've written essays mostly just for myself. <laughs> so, you know, sharing sharing this with the world has just been really interesting because other people are reading it. I have several family members that have read the piece and I spoke about this on a different panel, but, um, you know, it's my memories, it's, it's my lived experience. And I have family members that are like, are you sure that happens? Because I was there and I don't believe it did. And I'm like, well, it did but you probably weren't paying attention because it didn't affect you the way that it affected me. Um, and so I feel like, you know, it's, it's hard to write about yourself. And I know like for you, Natasha, it was in poetry format, which I find so beautiful because I feel like part of my piece in the opening is, is um, I, I kind of like relied on the poet in me to get out some of that information. So I thought that was really cool. So can you talk a little bit about how you, how you drew from your experience in your other form of writings to write your piece for this collection? Mm -hmm. We can start with you, Natasha. Yeah, I mean, so for me, poetry, I think has always been the, the way I find um, I can express my emotions the easiest. Um, and it always has been since I was a little kid. I never had journals or diaries, but I would write poems. Um, and so when I find that I'm struggling with uh, writing anything, um, I try to write it in poetry format. And oftentimes I have an easier time doing it that way if it's something that I can't get out in prose. Um, doesn't doesn't work as well in screenwriting, um, which is why I plot my screenplays <laughs> and um, I'm a pantser in other in, in all other writing. Um, but I find that it's 
I can be um, I can be most open when I'm writing poetry because I can be abstract and I can use metaphor in in a um, creative way that allows me to be really vulnerable, but it feels a little bit less. Um, it feels like I'm masking it in a way, I guess. Um, and so I was struggling with this project because I don't even remember what I pitched you as what my essay was going to be, but whatever it was, it was not coming out. And I was like, this is a mess and I don't know what to do. Um, and I was like, let me just try. Let me just try to write a poem trying to get out. Like, Cause I had ideas, but I just didn't know what the overarching story was going to be. And so I just started writing and, and really it, it came out pretty, once I did this, it came, once I made that decision, it came out pretty easily. And I think, um, I think in poetry, you can really run with emotion, right? Like it's like, it's all vibes. And like, I love that. And so um, that's sort of, that's just the only way I could figure out how to, how to write it. Um, and I think, you know, I sort of did the same thing in Color Me and there's poetry interspersed throughout the book. Um, it's, it's a novel written in prose, but there's poetry interspersed throughout it. Um, and it was sort of a similar thing where the, when I tr turned in the first draft, it was missing something. There was like the, her, the main character's voice wasn't there. And when I went back to, to edit it and I, I integrated poetry as the way that we sort of got into her head it brought the whole book together. And so I think for me, poetry is just a really, um, it's always sort of the, the missing piece of the puzzle when I'm trying to explain something or I'm trying to tell a story. So, um, so that was the only way, that was the only way you were getting something out of me for this book. <laughs> I, I, I truly do love this poem. And so I'm going to read a quick snippet because I want you to dig in and, and sort of like expand on this for us. So it's two different um, stanzas. Um, so this one is, it starts with, I would tell you that wrapping myself up as your party favor is not a gift, but no one told me I could be my own. And, and that for me was just like, pff, wow. And then like this, um, this next stanza, hold on, let me find it. Okay. I've heard it before that you probably mean no harm when you challenge me to speak in a language I only know and lullabies and your curiosity is an opportunity for growth I should nurture. I would say that I have no interest in gardening, but this party has gone on long enough now for me to open my mouth to sing with the sirens, then wipe the blood from my lips as you run down the stairs. So for me, immediately the, the part where it's like, I've heard it before that you probably mean no harm when you challenge me to speak in a language I only know in lull lullabies um, and your curiosity is an opportunity for growth I should nurture. I feel like people who don't understand, you know, where I come from or who I am, they do have these curiosities and, and, and it is for them a learning opportunity. But for me, it's like for the last 32 years of my life, <laughs> It's been me having to explain. And so for us, it doesn't feel that way. Uh, but those two stanzas in particular, I mean, I love the whole entire piece. I don't want to read it here on the screen, but I would love for you to talk about, you know, the sort of the ideas behind that, because those two stanzas are so powerful and there's so much to unpack there. Um, I don't know if you want to tackle one first, but what, what, you know, what were you thinking? Like, what do you want the reader to take take um, out from you know from the from this poem, from those two stanzas, from any other stanzas that you were that you wrote? Yeah, I mean, um, I think honestly, both of those uh, stanzas are sort of getting to the same point, which was what I said when you asked your earlier question about how um, about um, you know our identities and and how it feels to try to to be a part of our communities and who we are as a whole and and my whole my whole thing about like getting to a place of like your other people's thoughts about who I am and where I come from and whether or not they believe me or think it's I have a right to it that's like not about me that's about them and and um you know I recognize that 
oftentimes people are well-meaning when they have questions or they want to understand or they're confused as to how I could be all these things and look how I do or, you know, because I look how I do, that's sort of it. And why am I ma making any other, you know, why am I worrying about anything else? Because I am white, for, you know, in terms of how people see me. Um, and I think that, A, people are allowed to feel and think however they want it feel and think, but for so long, um, it made me doubt myself and made me not want to, not, made me not feel confident in, in who I am. And, um, so it's sort of like, I had to get to a place of being like, you're going to think what you're going to think. Um, that's not about me and I'm going to love myself in, in totality. And, um, and if that is going to be a problem, then it's going to be your problem. And so that's really, you know, that's really the, that's, and that's really the whole point of the poem, right? Is it's angry. And it's because <laughs> I've had to hold the anger in it's sort of the whole poem. It's sort of like building up because the anger is just building and building because it's the same interaction. I'm so used to having, I mean, in college, it got to the point where um, people so often didn't believe my background. I started carrying around family photos in my wallet. Cause I got so like, people used to drag me around parties being like, guess her, guess, guess her background, like guess her. And it's like, it's, it's, it's a lot. And so, um, you know, so it's sort of getting to that place of just like, I'm just going to release it. And if you keep pushing, then, that's, <laughs> then you're pushing and you're going to get pushed back, you know? So it's sort of, that was those two stanzas I think are, are trying to, to own that, um, own that, Ability to love myself to wholly, totally. Yes, yes, I love that. I love that. It's so good. Um, and and Khalil, for 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 yours, you know, your essay is so personal, right? Like it's it you're you're talking about your family, you're talking about Brooklyn, um, you're you're talking about so many different things. You know, how how did your other writing inform this? You know, did you? come to it in reporting style, journalistic style, or did you do something different? You know, I, I really wanted it to read as a story. I wanted it to feel like a coming of age story. Um, and what I learned through the process was that you really got to paint the picture for people. And I had to realize that, um, and that's something that I, I say I do, but I, I've never done it to this extent. Um, because in my mind, you kind of forget, like, these are my memories, remember them, how I remember them. If right. I'm trying to convey it to people, I need to see it, how I'm seeing it. Uh, I really got to spell things out. And um, I don't know if I really took that from any other writing that I do, because this was much more longer form. Um, but I think the elements of, of my technique that I took from the writing that I do is, is more so just the time that I put in. It wasn't hard for me to you know, to sit down and, and churn it out. Um, Cause I really, when it comes down to it, uh, I looked at this as a fresh opportunity to do something new, to do something I just as had, hadn't done. I was telling a new story to other people. These are stories I've always had, but to other people, this would have been, you know, nothing they've ever you know, seen before. And I felt if I could give them this first person view of what it's like to be a urban kid from Brooklyn, never, you know, to, to experiencing lizards running in the crib every day like it's nothing <laughs> to everyone else yeah. um i thought that would be just a, a unique uh spin on things i thought it would help my story stand out um i think i probably take uh humor from a lot of my writing that i do um uh, and, and, and uh different type of exclamations that i might make uh, i try to drizzle that also in the story help keep a reader engaged, you know, make them laugh, uh, yeah. things of that nature. So that's what I'm saying. You know, what I found really interesting about your piece is um, I didn't get on a plane until I was in high school. So for me, reading your story as another, as another, um, not just like another Latin person, but like as a young, you know, person from Brooklyn, who, you know, came from a similar environment that I did at like, I think you were like five, right? In your piece where you're like, I'm, I'm getting on a plane to like Six. fly internationally. Yeah. And I was just like, dude, I didn't go on my first international flight 
until I was in my 20s and like I didn't get on a plane and you know until I was in high school and so I love that representation alone on the page, you know, showing a young person of color traveling because we see so many wonderful stories in the media about, you know, non-BIPOC um, children traveling internationally, going to London, going to Paris, going to, you know, the Caribbean to vacation at some of our, uh, some of our countries where we have ancestry from. And I just thought that alone is actually so something to celebrate. I was like, I hope that there is, you know, a young, a young BIPOC boy out there that, um, you know, this essay, is, it, your essay is shared with them to say like, look, this, you know, traveling outside of Brooklyn, or, you know, your, your, your um, home city is possible. And like, look at all of the things that you can explore, because, you know, it's it's like one thing to be in your environment. And like you said, you were surrounded in your essay by other um, Caribbean people. So like, that was, a, that was a normal thing for you. But then to like go to Panama and then be around black Spanish speakers was so um, inspirational for you and validating because, you know, you're at, at your school, you're like, no one knows. No one knows the type of food that I eat at home or no one recognizes that I'm that I can, you know, I speak Spanish at home and et cetera, et cetera. They, they think this about me. And so I, I just love that about your essay because I feel like there are so many, you know, boys or male presenting people in the world who don't necessarily um, express their emotions the same way that you know, girl, you know, young girls um, um, do or, or even um, folks within the queer community. And so I thought it was really important to have that uh, part of your essay be in there because um, traveling is a thing that most people of color don't even get to do. You know, like um, my stepdad has never been on a plane and I, and I, and yeah, he's never been on a plane. He's like, I, he drives everywhere. And I'm like, we got to get you on an international flight. Like you, you know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta go on vacation. And he's like, yeah, I want to do it. But he's also nervous because he's like, at this point, <laughs> at this point in his life, he's like, do I want to get on an airplane even? And I'm like, no, yes, you, you have to, you have to. So um, can you talk a little bit about, or did you even think about that? Like how impactful that was? Did you have other friends you know, your age, were they traveling too around this time? Or, you know, cause you probably were like the big wig when you came back, you're like, what's up? I just got off the plane. And all these kids were probably like, tell us, you know, tell us how it was. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I was trying to also do with this story, uh, it was sort of like a, a thank you letter to my family. Um, it's not, I didn't want it to be blatant and in your face, but I'll, you know, I want them to feel gratitude when they read it. Um, and that goes from my cousins that I mentioned who were excited. They, I ain't tell anybody what was in it. I just wrote it. I'm like, you know, and they picked it up out of the sake of picking it up. You know what I mean? And, and then they say, oh, you know, I, you meant, I would remember that. And I'm like, don't no worry, man. It's all, it's all in here. I think um, I wanted to be intentional about making it sort of a tribute to my family, you know, to, to be able to give my the abuelo this book when I go upstairs, it's going to be cool as hell. And abuela is still alive. And you know they're not together as I mentioned in the book, but they live around the corner from each other. Still, he can still go give it to her when he gets back to Panama, you know, next week. So it's 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 definitely intentional. Um, I wanted to uh, just give people their roses. My mother thought it was a priority for me to travel at a young age. You know that she would always say that when I was young. She'd be like, I'm making sacrifices because we need to see the world and da da da. And she was very adamant about it. My mother. Uh, different type of mother my mother had me at 43 you know so she's an old woman um and so she had a certain way of an handling me i guess she saw a little bit more of the world at that point and, and just had her takes on it and wanted to make sure that i, I had certain experiences um even the experience of leaving you know my my my, my cousins my tia stayed back you know so it was just we all the kids traveled we traveled with a group of kids we didn't travel with them and i didn't even know that first time i went that my mother would come down later that summer you know so it was my first time away from my mother so that was like the wildest of experiences for me. I never knew a world without her up until that point. Um, and they're just like, oh, you're going to stranger and you're going to these other strangers. <laughs> but here's your kid, here's your, here's your cousin, like calm down and relax for four hours <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> and I knew who I was going to see. Like I, I was cool with that. Get, it was just the fact of getting there was the task. 
And that, the first time around, stressed me out like no other. But once we got it out the way the first time, I loved it, you know. Um, and I was, you know, other kids didn't uh, have those same opportunities. I, I didn't take it for granted in the slightest. Um, you know, you'll come back next school year and they'll ask you, you know, what'd you do for the summer? And I'd always, fortunately, thankfully, I've always had some type of story. I did something new. Panama was just a handful of the trips I made as a kid, man. I did, you know, my first drafts of, of the story, I talked about seeing bats in Barbados, you know, um, and how that affected me. At certain times, they would all fly up, you know, from the trees. So I've seen, you know, other countries and um, just fortunate to have had those experiences that never, you know, was unappreciated on my end. That's awesome. I feel like your your essay is almost like just a mini memoir. Like it's the beginning yeah. of a full memoir. And Lonely. I, I can it see is. it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, so uh, to the audience members, we're gonna move over to audience questions. So um, we have one from Caroline, who's actually uh, one of our one of our editors um, at Flatiron. Uh, hi, Sericia, Khalil, and Natasha. Can you tell us about where the title comes from and how you think it resonates with each of your individual essays? Um, so the title "Wild Things Can't Be Tamed" is uh, sort of taken from Borderlands by Gloria Azondua's um, book that came out many moons ago, and I think for me, that book just it you know she's tackling so many different things in in it right like the 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 borders between home country and and here in the U.S. but also like identity and feminism and what it means to be queer and et cetera and I think for me it just resonates with my essay because my my essay is just really all about identity and and trying to find my place in the world um and i think i, I feel like the title resonates with a lot of with a lot of the pieces but i'll i'll let you you know you two speak to it but for me that that's one of the things um for sure but also just i feel like it's it's like just giving me permission, just while tongues can't be tamed, it gives me permission to just like speak my truth and to be okay with it and like to stand firm and, you know, just, yeah, just to stand firm and and, and say that like, I, I, can, I can speak whatever I wanna speak, I can be whatever I wanna be despite what society tries to make me out to be, if that makes sense. I agree. Who should take it? Should I take Julio, it? Julio, you go. Yeah, you go. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'll i piggyback to what Cerecia said. Um, the title for me spoke to, you know, telling the truth. And I felt like, uh, you know, among my friends, uh, people I, you know, ma mainly my friends, I mean, they knew sort of some of the things that uh, I discussed in the book about how Afro-Latinos are, are perceived and just the different things that we may come across. Um, individually, when we get to deeper, you know, granular discussions at times, um, and I just, I just wanted to put it, put those concerns or those uh, issues on a grander stage. I thought that was this was the place to have those types of or spark those types of conversations. Um, and I think the title allowed me to be as detailed about my feelings towards those things, and also my feelings towards how I internalized certain things as a kid. I get very, uh, you know, detailed about that. And I never told them stories about like uh, the potlucks and no one eat my food. Those things are like suppressed, you know what I mean? But I, I never forgot it. And I was like, you know what, this is the time to, to write it. You know, the type of writing I usually do, no one cares about that <laughs> for me. They want like, you know, stuff that's gonna get clicks and, I, and there's a place for that. So I'm not knocking it, but, um, I think this was my time to, to, to sort of let all that go because I know I'm not the only one that uh, that goes through it. You know, I, I told uh, a friend of mine, you know, I bumped into a, a friend I went in, I went to junior high with at the Panamanian Day Parade in October. And uh, I told my cousin that was there afterwards, I said, you know, you always remember the other Panamanians that you went to school with because there's like five of us in life. And I, <laughs> I haven't seen them in like 10, 11 years. And as soon as I seen them, it was like, what's up like it was like no, no time passed you never forget your Panamanian friends <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean so the the title just spurred me to just say yo this is the time to really 
lay it all out there in a you know engaging way. That's my hope. I just want no one to be bored of what I wrote. I hope it's engaging and uh, and, and satisfying, like like a good meal. I mean, that's that's how I rate everything. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, how about for you? Um, yeah, so I think I think just like your tongue, it's connected to your voice, right? It's connected to speech and um, the power of your voice and, um, you know, the way that I think so many people within the Latinx community and also any other marginalized community have been silenced, have been um, tamed for lack of a better word. And this being the way of breaking free of that and, um, in my poems specifically, in some ways, I, I used it sort of literally in that in the beginning of the poem, I am coming from a place of, of biting my tongue. And by the end of it, I'm biting someone else's tongue. And so um, sort of saying like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to hold my, I'm not going to hold my voice in anymore. If you're going to, if you're going to be uh, jabbing me with your intrusive questions and thoughts and uh, projecting that onto me, then you're getting it right back. And so um, I, I, I sort of took it literally in as a prompt almost as a way of um, tying it, tying it back into this just overall idea of, of co coming into owning my whole self and, you know, my voice being the centerpiece of that. Mm, I love that. That was such a fantastic question. Um, so we're we're coming up on time. Um, so I would love for each of you to sort of um, you know let let folks know where they can find you online. Um, you know, do you have a, a, a newsletter, a social handle, or anything like that that you want to share? Um, and of course, if you have another project that you're working on, feel free to to mention that. So we can start with you, Natasha. Um, yeah. So I'm at. Tashi Diaz on um, both Instagram and Twitter and um, or did I change it I might have changed it to Natasha Erica Diaz it's one of the two I'm not sure um, and um, I have a bunch of projects that I can't talk about yet but um, I am also a part of two um, novels told in stories so they're not anthologies but they're one story told by multiple authors um, one that was just announced called House Party, um, which is being edited by Justin Reynolds. And I think it's gonna be really fun. And then another called The Grimoire of Grave Fates, which is um, a magical murder mystery at a wizarding school. So um, those two are coming out, I wanna say in 2023. Sounds so interesting. I love a magical whodunit. Um, Khalil, what about you? Oh, well, you know, my social handles um, on Twitter, I am at Damn Pops, uh, which is a moniker given to me in college, sort of ties in my my uh, column name, Damn You Got a Point and whatnot. Uh, and on Instagram, you could uh, follow me at Damn It Pops. Uh, only thing coming up uh, that I think anyone could catch, I mean, you could definitely uh, read Damn You Got a Point on ebony.com, which is my column. Um, I also interviewed uh, the current WWE champion last week, which was, was a lot of fun. I interviewed him for Blavity. So you could catch that interview, I believe, next week towards the end of the week at some point, Thursday or Friday. Um, and other than that, that that's, that's about it. Um, so happy to have been a part of this project. Um, humble. This has been a joy. Thank you. Um, and you can find me on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, but I'm barely on Facebook and on TikTok <laughs> um, uh, at SJ underscore Fennell. Um, and also you can sign up for my newsletter, um, Black Girl Dreaming, which I just, I, I write about everything that I do in my life because if, if, you, if you do follow me on social media, you know I'm out here doing a lot in these streets. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um and I think you know for for me we'll see what's on the horizon but you know I'm just here slowly writing and, and editing things um and that's it so I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for tuning in anymore if you're gonna if you're gonna be uh jabbing me with your 
intrusive questions and thoughts and uh, projecting that onto me, then you're getting it right back. And so um, I, I, I sort of took it literally in as a prompt almost as a way of um, tying it, tying it back into this just overall idea of, of co coming into owning my whole self and, you know, my voice being the centerpiece of that. Mm, I love that. That was such a fantastic question. Um, so we're, we're coming up on time. Um, so I would love for each of you to sort of, um, you know, let, let folks know where they can find you online. Um, you know, do you have a, a, a newsletter, a social handle or anything like that, that you want to share? Um, and of course, if you have another project that you're working on, feel free to, to mention that. So we can start with you, Natasha. Um, yeah, so I'm at Tashi Diaz on um, both Instagram and Twitter. And, um, or did I change it? I might have changed it to Natasha Erica Diaz. It's one of the two. I'm not sure. Um, and um, I have a bunch of projects that I can't talk about yet, but um, I am also a part of two um, novels told in stories. So they're not anthologies, but they're one story told by multiple authors. Um, Mm -hmm. One that was just announced called House Party, um, which is being edited by Justin Reynolds. And I think it's going to be really fun. And then another called The Grimoire of Grave Fates, which is um, a magical murder mystery at a wizarding school. So um, those two are coming out, I want to say in 2023. Sounds so interesting. I love a magical whodunit. Um, Khalil, what about you? Oh, well, you know, my social handles um, on Twitter, I am at Damn Pops, uh, which is a moniker given to me in college, sort of ties in my my uh, column name, Damn You Got a Point and whatnot. Uh, and on Instagram, you could uh, follow me at Damn It Pops. Uh, one thing coming up uh, that I think anyone could catch, I mean, you could definitely uh, read Damn You Got a Point on ebony.com, which is my column. Um, I also interviewed uh, the current WWE champion last week, which was, was a lot of fun. I interviewed him for Gravity. So you can catch that interview, I believe, next week towards the end of the week at some point, Thursday or Friday. Um, and other than that, that that's, that's about it. Um, so happy to have been a part of this project. I'm humble. This has been a joy. Thank you. Um, and you can find me on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, but I'm barely on Facebook and on TikTok <laughs> uh, uh, at SJ underscore Fennell. Um, and also you can sign up for my newsletter, um, Black Girl Dreaming, which I just, I, I write about everything that I do in my life because if, if you, if you do follow me on social media, you know, I'm out here doing a lot in these streets. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um and I think you know for for me we'll see what's on the horizon but you know I'm just here slowly writing and, and editing things um and that's it so I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for tuning in 